Nice to have Steve as our chairman this evening. I like the way he welcomed everybody and said it's good to see you. That's really good. I'm getting used to it over here. Thank you, Steve, for leading us this evening. And you're all so welcome. Lovely to see you all. And nice to see some young ones here. For many years of my younger life, I was able to see, say it's nice to see some other young people here. But now I'm an old guy. I have to say it's nice to see some young people here. You are very, very welcome. God bless you all for coming. We're living in tremendous days, and we're gathered in the, before an open Bible to hear what the Lord will teach us from His Word. And uh, it is lovely to have you all here. Now, before we read from the Scriptures, um, a number of books are on the left-hand side, and I, I have a sales assistant called James, and he is really cool. He'll, he'll serve you at the back. A number of very good DVDs, you can't get them only through the Prophetic Witness Movement, through myself. Um, they're not in the ordinary Bible shops. Uh, they're, they're good, but they don't stock the same as we do. And this evening, this uh, very popular book, the popular handbook on the rapture, if you can get one of those, it's a compilation by Tim LaHaye, Thomas Ice, Ed Heisen, Heinsen, and a very, very marvelous young man coming up now in England, Dr. Paul Wilkinson. He has a formidable intellect. He's a fine historian, and he's totally committed to the faith of the Scriptures and the premillennial faith of the Word of God. We thank God for him. He's written in this book. If you can get one, that will fill you in on the future of the church until the Lord gets back. It is a marvelous book. Of course, in the end, we only hold to one book. as the book God wrote for us. And he wrote it by divine inspiration. And you keep to that book. But these will help you. And that's on the bookstore. Don't forget the popular handbook on the rapture. And do have a look at some of the books as you leave through the doors there and on the left. Now, it's a special joy for me, folks, to be in your lovely country here in Northern Ireland. I've been coming, I perhaps told you, on Sunday since 1969. You remember what happened in 1969? Well, if you forgot, the bullets were flying. And I was among them. That's the year that the trouble started. And I came as a young boy from Cliff College in England. One of the places I went in those early days was to hold a gospel mission in the town hall in Coleraine. A big town hall, and it was packed. Several hundred came every night. And I was junior to a famous preacher called the Reverend Maynard James, a Welsh preacher. He was a, a dynamo, and I was his sort of sidekick. I don't know what you call me, but it, we would alternate night by night. And we had a wonderful mission in Coleraine. Is that a city now, Coleraine? No. Okay. Well, I won't tell them what you said. It's all right. There's still a town then, Coleraine. It was a very nice town, as I remember it. And uh, there was a, a people I stayed with there. They said to me, you know, Brother Alec, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was a mission held in this town hall that the town never forgot. It was conducted by W.P. Nicholson. Oh, I pricked my ears up because he is one of my heroes. W.P. Nicholson, what a man he was. And hundreds and hundreds came every year to Christ through his evangelistic endeavors. And she told me, and the, the old couple where I was stopping, a wonderful story. Mr. Nicholson used to leave the town hall, Coleraine, as, as I left it every night. And he would wend his way back to the digs with Christians where he was staying. And he would pass a big drinking club. There's maybe a hundred or more boys in there drinking. And just as he had finished counseling and preaching in the town hall, like I was telling you, and all the boys were coming out, and some of them were the worst for wear, and they were shouting and so on. And WP, he got a real burden that he should tell these boys about the Lord Jesus Christ. So early one morning, he went to see the landlord of the pub. He says, Landlord, would you let me, they all knew him, they had to introduce himself, would you let me preach to the boys as they come out tonight? As they come out, how about 10 or 11? I don't know when it was turning that time. Would you let me do that? Well, the landlord was, he was smart. He says, yes, Mr. Nicholson, you can do that. And you can stand in the forecourt of my property here. And you can preach the gospel if you'll use as the pulpit 
a barrel of my best beer. And if you'll stand on a barrel of beer and preach to the boys, he's going to make some fun, you see, when they all came out. He said, Mr. Nicholson, you can do it. He says, you're on. Next night, he left the town hall in Coleraine, and he got to where all the boys were coming out. WP stood on a barrel, stood on a barrel. It had to stand on it full. He could have talked. He's a big man. So it was full up, and he stood on the barrel of beer. As the boys come out, he said, I've always wanted to preach the gospel with the devil under my feet. And he says, praise the Lord, I got the devil under my feet tonight. One young boy, he says, Mr. Nicholson, is drink an enemy of man? Aye, son, he says it is. Enemy of your body. It'll rot your liver. It'll poison your insides. As an enemy of your soul, it'll take you to hell. Drinks an enemy of, of man and is your enemy. Well, Mr. Nicholson said the young boy, he was smart. He says in the good book you got in your hand, it says we're to love our enemies. And I love mine, he said. <laughs> but WP, he wouldn't be stuck. He says, young man, it says in this book, love your enemies, not swallow them. <laughs> so, uh, what a man. I wish I could think of things like that. And we remember him with great thanksgiving to the Lord. Now then, I want you to turn in your Bibles this evening. If you haven't brought a Bible, don't be embarrassed. Just listen and follow. And again, it's great to see you all. The two key passages on the rapture are the catching away of God's people at moment when the Lord will come to take his waiting people home. Uh, not religious people, but redeemed people home. The two key passages are in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll read selective sections from both of those. The rapture, of, as we shall find in the evening message tonight, is not mentioned in the Old Testament, it is alluded to. But the rapture was a New Testament mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope and is no future. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, the word means precede, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet. It can be in the Greek shofar, a sounding instrument, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, and we note here that the apostle did not expect to die. He thought he would be alive when the Lord came at the second advent, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And friends, what a wonderful conclusion to this dra drama of the rapture. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Will you turn back, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, to the other key passage concerning the future of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're down that chapter Please, at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption, he's thinking of our earthly, physical, aging bodies, inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. It means we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, the living believers, shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Paul then proceeds to do something that few, 
even the most genuine Christian would dare to do. He proceeds to mock death. He says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory over death, that is, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know. And I trust we who serve the Lord, you're serving the Lord, that we do know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Will you turn back to the Old Testament, please? It's a strange place to jump, but to the book of the Old Testament called Job. One of the oldest books in the canon of Scripture, the, the book of Job in the Old Testament. And we're at verse, chapter 14, and we're at verse 10. Job, just before Psalms in the middle of the Bible. Job chapter 14, and we're at verse 10. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, dies. Where is he? As the waters fall from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. O oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldst appoint me a set time and remember me. And then he says, If a man die, shall he live again? Is death the end? Or if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Now if you were following those words pessimistic words of the Old Testament writer Job. No doubt you will have traced this, that here is a man, an Old Testament saint, saint, he said, though he slay me, yet will I love him, the sufferings of Job, but here Job is living in a fog about the future of believers. He was totally unsure of the destiny of those beyond death who know and love the God of the Bible. If a man die, shall he live again? He asks, and I guess that many in 21st century in our country, they're asking just the same. What really happens to us when we die? Will we all die? Is it possible that some people will never die? As we read in 1 Corinthians 15. What happens when a non-believer dies? An unbeliever dies in sin. Many of these profound and ultimate questions of life and death are answered in that Corinthian, 1 Corinthians 15 passage, which we often call the great resurrection chapter. Well, brothers and sisters, I've got great good news for you tonight. Christians are going to live forever, here or there. Life is not finalized with the funeral. Death is not the end. Secular people like to think that way. And evolution indicates that way, although evolution has never conjectured beyond, I don't think, this physical human life. But friends, how wonderful to know, although the world thinks that once we're dead, we're done for, the Bible says that they're gonna have a great shock. And the best news that we've got tonight is the news that one day, every born-again, blood-washed, redeemed believer in Jesus Christ will be taken from the earth. All over the world we will go. We shall be evacuated, taken out of the world, we'll be caught up in a great uh, aerial rendezvous. We're going to look at that right now in the scriptures. We'll be caught up in a great meeting in the sky and the Bible says as we read, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And friends, that is what is going to happen to you and me. And that is our blessed hope. We read in Titus chapter 2 and that is our future. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to be forever with the Lord and to know that we're going to be caught up in that great meeting in the sky. We shall be caught up defying the grave and gravity 
and we shall be caught up in that great uh, flight into space. They call it whatever we like. Different preachers have different ways of expressing themselves. But what a wonderful day that will be when Jesus receives his own. Mind you, when we have gone, hell is going to be let loose in this world. And we think the world's a pretty rough place now. Wars, and death, and killing. Periods of human history, some of them fairly contemporary. I was born when the war started. The second one, you know, not the first one. And uh, I was as a baby in an air shelter with bombs, the Luftwaffe, of bomb, uh, bombs. Yeah, we, li we live in a world, and people have asked, is this the great tribulation? Some Christians in the parts, some parts of the world today might be asking, is this the great tribulation? May I say to you that when the great tribulation comes, no one in the world will ask that question. They will all know it's here. Tomorrow night we're going to study the future of a world without God. Hell will be let loose once the church is gone. So let's look at this this evening and find out what the scriptures teach us about this wonderful catching up, this uh, removal, this evacuation, I've used that word, when the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We read from it, but we'll go back to it again. And I want to call your atten attention to some verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're at verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain, that is, we who will live to the second advent, the second coming of the Lord, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, that is, the saints who've gone before, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord that I quoted a moment ago. Look back up the verse and see two words in the English Bible, caught up. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. But in the Greek Bible, one word, harpazo or harpazo. What does that word mean, caught up, harpazo? What does it really mean? Well now, the Greek verb harpazo means literally to seize or snatch something and take it from one place and put it in another place. It's to remove something from one spot and put it in another spot. One book I have on the rapture is called The Big Snatch. Good title, right? It's a sudden seizing and snatching. Harpazo. And we're going to be seized. We're going to be snatched. We're going to be harpazo. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, the Greek word there is atomos, that which is indivisible. One moment we'll be here, and the next moment we'll be in a flash, one atomic flash, we shall be home with the Lord. And as I've mentioned a moment ago, friends, the salt and the light will be taken from the world. Jesus said to his own, you are the salt of the earth. And then he said, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine a world when the salt and the light have been gone, are removed? You can see what will happen to the world that is left behind after the harpezo or the catching up or the snatching away. The revealed picture in the, in the scripture is of the Lord Jesus coming to burgle the world as a thief in the night. He's coming to take us home to be with him. Now every Christian here this evening, I hope, knows John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 3, where the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to look it up, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Hey, that's good. Hey, that's good. If, if nobody else or if it was no one else in the Bible, that would be good enough for me. Jesus said, I will come again. That fixes it. That's, that's it. 
And then he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Because I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. A verse that I think every Christian here will know. The verse teaches me what the Lord Jesus is doing now. What is employing Jesus Christ today? Well, in the letter to the Ephesians, we read that he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's pleading, praying for us, praying for you, not for the world, but for me, John chapter 17. But he also says in that John 14 verse, he's preparing a heaven, preparing the many mansions bright. He's preparing a place, but he doesn't want to be there on his own. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And because I do that, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Hey, he's teaching the rapture, the harpezo. He's teaching that first phase of the second coming program when the Lord will come to take his waiting people home. You see, the second coming isn't one flash. It isn't one big bang. Some people think the second coming is one big bang. If you try and take it apart, you become confused. So just leave it like that, one sort of a big bang. Brothers and sisters, the second coming of Jesus is a whole train of triumphant events, beginning with the rapture. And later he will come to the Mount of Olives. Now, I want to try and share something with you here that might help some of you, although some of you I'm sure will know this. I could only ever make sense of the second coming as it is taught in the scripture when I saw that it would be in two distinct phases or stages. It's not two comings, there aren't three comings of Jesus, only two. It's one advent, but two events that dominate it. Shall I say that again? The second coming is one advent, but two events dominate the program. The coming of the Lord is a whole program. First, he will come to the air for his own. The rapture, harpezo, we're studying that this evening. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye, I've already mentioned. Seven years later, well I haven't time to talk to you about that, but seven years later, the end of Daniel's 70th week, the Lord Jesus will come on a very different mission. He will come to the Mount of Olives to strike the world in judgment and to lay into the world of sin. He will come at a moment when human history has reached a great crisis, the Battle of Armageddon, which will be fought on the soil of the Middle East. So he comes first of all for his saints, the rapture, you and me. And later he will come with his saints. Two stages. Only one advent. We get accused of teaching three advents. One advent, two events which dominated. We're thinking of the first event. And I submit to you just here, the rapture will trigger the whole program off. My understanding of the scripture, and please, I don't know everything, but please, my understanding of the word of God is that the next event on the divine agenda is tonight's study, the rapture, when the Lord will come. And once we have gone, the rest of the program will roll and Jesus will come to the world in judgment at the Battle of Armageddon. We will come back to the Battle of Armageddon with him. Once we read, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Once we've gone to be with him, he'll never be parted from him from him. We'll be with him when he comes to the Mount of Olives, with him throughout the thousand years reign. We'll be with him and never parted from him once he has come to collect us. So let's look into the scriptures here. I invite you again to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we're at verse 52, please. 1 Corinthians 15 and we're at verse 52. Lovely to see all the Bibles opening tonight. And if I may say so, it's lovely to see the young people I think I've already mentioned. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're at verse, please, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, 
for the trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we, the living believers, shall be changed. Friends, the removal of the church will take place in a split second. I've already told you the Greek word here, atomos, uh, in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know how long it takes to twinkle your eye um, or, or to wink your eye. One preacher, he said, you hold a coin like this and you just let it go on a wooden floor and the, the space, the, the length of time it takes for that coin to leave your fingers and bang on the floor. That is the twinkling of an eye. Well, that's, that's okay. Certainly it will be very, very fast. One moment we'll be here and the next moment we shall be gone. Dead saints who we shall see in a moment sleep in Jesus, the Bible says. That is, their bodies sleep in the ground. They will be raised first. They will be the first to see the Lord Jesus. But we will be right on their heels. We shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Number two, first of all, the rapture will take place in a moment. Secondly, the rapture will be preceded by the trumpet. A trumpet shall sound. Now, what does this mean? Well, I have to say to you as a student of the Scriptures, there are two or three different thoughts here. The one I like the best is that in ancient Israel, in the armies, and in the British army, and in all armies of the world, the trumpet plays a very important place. The one that gets you up in the morning is called Revali. Now, I was never in the army. I was in the Salvation Army once. <laughs> that was a bit different, isn't it? But the, the trumpet sounds to get up and then a trumpet for your breakfast and your dinner and the meals. The summoning of soldiers is a summons by a trumpet. In ancient Israel, and I studied this in the Hebrew, the last trumpet, the last trump, as it's mentioned here, the trumpet shall sound, and later it's called at the last trumpet, was the trumpet that sounded in the camps of the armies of Israel the trumpet that sounded, pull up your tent pe pegs, boys, the battle's over, we're going home. What a beautiful thought. The rapture will summon God's armies home. The battle won for us. The last trumpet will be to call us and summons us through the skies into the everlasting presence of the man who loved us. And we shall see him. We shall be forever with the Lord. Are you looking forward to seeing the man who died for you? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. I am. I've never seen him. I only know him by faith. You're the same. We've never seen the Lord Jesus. Is it John in his epistle? He says, whom having not seen, you love. That's right. I love someone I've never seen in my life. I've never seen the Lord Jesus. I only know him by faith, heart to heart. But one day he's coming for me. Praise God. And I shall see the man who died for me. I guess it'll blow my brains out. I'll be so thrilled to see him. Not only will I see him, I'm going to be like him. And I'm going to teach you about that on Friday. When I see him, something's going to happen to my body. I shall be like him. And I shall see him as he is. This is the glorious future of the child of God and the destiny of the church. The rapture will take place in a moment. It will be preceded by a trumpet. We can't be dogmatic, but it could mean, pull up your tank peg, boys. Boys, the battle's won. Number three, the rapture of dead saints, up the rapture dead saints will live and will be raised out of their graves. Let's study well 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 53. You probably have it open in fr front of you. Verse 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible, follow carefully, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Turn back in your Bible to verse 50. Now we've read this, but we're going back to study it closely. 
Now this I say, writes the inspired apostle brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And we note that Paul says uh, down the verses, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now what does this mean, and what is the teaching of the Word of God concerning the destiny of believers, and the harpezo, the rapture? What, what does this teach me? Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, I cannot live in eternity in this body. I won't do. You can't live in eternity in that body. Flesh and blood, aging flesh and blood, gets sick and it dies, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. For me to live in eternity with Christ, a great change will have to take place. And praise God, it's going to take place. And it's going to take place in a moment when we meet the Lord. He's going to give us a new body. It's as if the Bible says, you cannot live in this body. And we all know this actually, don't we? Why can I not live with Christ in eternity in this body, that is, as this body is now? Because it has in it the aging process. Can I cheer you up this evening? Doctors, as medical doctors, tell us that you and I began to die the day we were born. <laughs> that cheer you up tonight. <laughs> well, it's a fact of life. Secularism has no answer to the riddles of that. But I know the answer, it's because of Adam, by man came sin, by, by man came death, and so on. We haven't time for that this evening. But we live in a, a body that has an aging process. And uh, I may fight it, and I may resist it. It was lovely, it's lovely when you're young, like some of you boys and girl, youngsters here tonight. I enjoyed being long, uh, young. I could stay up all night and still do the next day and I could drive all night and still preach the next day when I was a young man. Ah, there were great days, the sky was the limit, and now I'm an old man. Mind you, I could still jump over the, the farmer's gate. If the farmer lifted it off its hinges and put it on the ground, I could. I think I could try it that way. Yes, flesh and blood. These aging bodies in which we are born, we can't escape it, it's inexorable. One day, unless Christ comes first, this body's going to fail, and I'm going to die. But here Paul teaches us a wonderful thing. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Listen, he's teaching about the bodies of the believers who've gone before. Maybe your mom and dad, your grand, grandma and granda, and they loved you and prayed for you, and now their dear dust lies in the grave. Is that the end? Was Job right? If a man dies, shall he live again? No, I'll show you how Job came into divine revelation and ended up believing the truth. But the dear dust of the dead, how wonderful, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, he's teaching about the bodies of the believers that will be alive when he comes. You see how the apostle differentiates between the saints whose bodies will be dead, they will be resurrected, and the bodies of the saints who will be alive when he comes, we will be translated and will be caught up in that great hallelujah convention in the skies, caught up to be forever with the Lord. The church, triumphant, resurrected, gone before. The church, militant, raptured and translated. How wonderful, caught up together to meet the Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful day that will be. I heard an American preacher, and mustn't copy them too much, but this American preacher, he says, you see, friends, he said, millions of God's people will go home by air. We'll be caught up. We shall not all sleep. I'll come to that in just a moment. Living saints will be translated and will go home at the rapture without ever dying. Millions more will have already died in the faith of Jesus Christ. The dear dust I mentioned lays in the grave. They will be resurrected first to see the Lord. And the preacher said, millions of us will go home by air, caught up by air. 
and the rest, he said, will go by the underground route. Uh, another preacher, they says, why will the dead in Christ rise first? Well, he says, they've got six feet further to go. <laughs> Are you getting it or not? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're down under the soil, right? So they've got a bit further to go. He said, that's why the dead in Christ rise first. Well, uh, uh, that's his sort of idea, you see. Well, how wonderful, this corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We will live forever here or there. Will the unbelieving dead also have a resurrection? Yep. You'll have to read Revelation chapter 20. At the end of the thousand years of global reign of Jesus Christ, the millennium we call it, millennium, a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, the unsaved of all the ages will be resurrected to come up at the great white throne. What a terrible thing that will be as multitudes and lived and died, who lived and died in conscious rejection of the love of God will face their maker. They will have to see the man who did everything he could to save them, but whose salvation and love they rejected. The unsaved will also be resurrected, not at the same time as us. We will go up at the first resurrection, but in Revelation 20, I think you'll find if you want to study it later, it's verse 19 or thereabouts, the unsaved will be taken up as well. Now then, I want you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and you've been so kind in your attention. Philippians chapter 3, and we're at verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, and at verse 20. For our conversation, it means our life, daily life, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow carefully, who shall change our vile body. One translation says, change the body of our humiliation, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Here is the mighty, omnipotent power of Christ. When he comes to the air for his own, he will be able to subdue all things unto himself. Because you see, multitudes of his children were blown to pieces in the wars. Others were drowned in the sea and were eaten by fishes. How can it be that the Lord will raise the dead? Will there be a bodily resurrection? Yes, there must be. Christ was raised. We must be raised. And we say, well, how can that be? We try with human reason to see divine revelation. Friends, I don't know, it's going to be a miracle. But here's a little clue. We came from dust, right? And we go to dust. But hold on a minute. What did God make us from, the Creator, in the book of Genesis, in the very dawn of human history and relationships and events? We were created from the dust. Surely it will not be a great thing for God in His omniscience to know where that dust is. Maybe there will be just one atom left, but He will know where we are. And He will raise us. Here's another fact from science. Did you know that nothing can actually be destroyed? Get a piece of paper and um, just put it on the fire. We say, what did you do with that piece of paper? Oh, I destroyed it. I chucked it on the fire. You haven't destroyed it. You've only changed it. Collect the gases from a scientific point of view. Collect the ashes and other things. It's still in the universe somewhere. You haven't destroyed it. You changed it. And it's like that I submit to you, suggest to you, with human life. And after all, Christ died for our bodies as well as our souls. Here our souls are saved. Our bodies are under the curse. But in Romans chapter 8, we could study it if we have time. 
We groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the body. That is, the body will be saved at the rapture, and I will get a new body. Now, some of you know the preacher, very famous English preacher who went to America and wrote some famous books. He was one of our prophetic witness leaders, Dr. Stephen Alford. He probably, I think he came uh, a number of times to Belfast. What a wonderful preacher Stephen Alford was. He's w away with the Lord now. Stephen Alford talks about, in one of his books, how he was preaching in one of these big American churches, I think several thousand in the congregation. And he was preaching about the, the body of our resurrection, the resurrection body. What will happen when Jesus comes? And living saints will never die, will be caught up to meet the Lord. And dead saints, their body lies sleeping in the ground until the resurrection morning, will be caught up and he is able to subdue all things unto himself. And he preached about this and he felt so moved and so anointed by the Holy Spirit. He said, friends, this morning, I'm not coming to the door to shake hands with the pastor. I'm going into the vestry. Anyone who would like a little word of counsel or prayer, you please may come and I, I will greet you lovingly and try and help you from the word of God. He said in his book, he was hardly through the door before the stewards opened the door, they knocked first and they came into the pastor's vestry and he said they wheeled into the vestry the most grotesque torso of a man he'd ever seen. He was shocked. He said, I had to control myself. A poor man with no legs, only one arm. And in the wheelchair he saw a man horribly emaciated, his eyes and his ears and his face. He said he was quite taken aback and he apologized. And he spoke to that man of his need of Christ. He found that he was a believer and his family had brought him. The stewards had brought him to see the preacher. He further discovered that that dear man was a veteran of the Vietnam conflict. And in Vietnam he'd been napalmed. And they got him back to America where the plastic surgeons had done miracles on him. He lost both his legs, one of his arms, his face, just two little eyes peeping out. They, they'd done their best, but the poor man was, was in terrible, ugly shape. And then he says to Stephen Alford, Mr. Alford, I liked your sermon. He spoke through the little slit that they'd been able to make for his mouth. Are you telling me that when Jesus Christ, our Savior, comes, He's going to give every one of us a brand new body like His? Like His? And Mr. Alford, you preached this morning from Philippians chapter 3. He's going to change the body of our humiliation, our vile bodies, like unto His own lovely body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things. You saying that Jesus Christ is going to do that literally, physically for sure, the preacher said, yes, my brother, the Bible says God is going to change our vile bodies. And then Stephen Alford said he noticed through the little uh, slots of the poor man's eyes, his lacrimal glands, you know, in under here where the tears are made, he saw the man was beginning to weep and then he sobbed and shook. And with his one ugly finger, that's all he had, with one arm, a crooked finger like this, he pointed as best he could to himself. He said, Mr. Alfred, do you think Jesus will be able to do anything with this? Poor man. Poor man. And he read to him again the scriptures. He will change our vile body, that it may be like unto his own lovely body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Friends, what a great future the church has got. One day we're going to live forever in a brand new body, like unto his lovely body. And he's going to change us physically and eternally. And how wonderful that we shall live forever with Christ. And just a few years ago, some of you heard me told us, tell us before, they had a number of really, really bright academics from Oxford, Cambridge. Supposed to be very clever if you've been there, you know. And they were all on there talking about the future of the church. Has Christianity got any future? Is there any future for the church? And all these clever men were on the television and all of them said the same thing. No, Christianity's had it. Christians have had it. There's no future for the church. 
I thought you boys have been educated beyond your intelligence. I wished I could have put my hand through the TV screen and poke one or two on the shoulders. I'd love to have said to them, excuse me, my academic sir. Christians are the only people in the world that have got a future. It's you that haven't got a future if you're without Jesus Christ. That's the kind of world we live in. Now, I want to show you something quickly in closing. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and verse 51. We've already read it, but we'll look to it again. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. I'm going back over these very important verses. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. See what Paul writes. Behold, I show unto you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That is, we shall not all die. We shall not all go through the valley of the sh shadow. Not all Christians are going to die. If the Lord comes first, we will, we will never die. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now then, what does this mean? Well, now, to us in our ordinary vernacular, the word mystery conveys to us an enigma, right? A mystery story, a murder story or something. A mystery is a, yeah, a puzzle. Something you can't understand, a mystery. But that's not what it means in Scripture. A mystery in the Bible, and there are seven in the New Testament, a mystery is a truth that has been hidden in ages past in the Old Testament, but is now revealed. Behold, I show unto you a hidden truth. The Old Testament saints never taught this. The prophets never taught it. They didn't know about this. But I'm going to show it to you. As a Bible apostle, with the gift of revelation for the Scriptures, behold, I'm going to teach you and show you a mystery. The secret is now out. And this is it, he says. We're not all going to sleep. But we're all going to be changed. Now what this means is, if we go back over all the Old Testament saints, we can read about them, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he died, and then so-and-so begat so All the Old Testament saints, there are thousands of them in the Scriptures. We'd have to conclude the only way that a man or woman could get from earth to heaven was through the valley of the shadow of death. You've got to die. As once I was teaching to some little children in the north of England, and I taught them the gospel all week, and on the final night we had a quiz. I said, now boys and girls, what does a man, a woman, or a boy, a girl got to do to go to heaven? I want them to say, repent and believe. Give your heart to Jesus Christ to be born again. He says, what must I do to go to heaven? This little kid puts his hand up. He says, die. Like that. <laughs> you die. Ah, but friends, that's not so. Behold, I show unto you a secret truth that was not revealed to the Old Testament saints. Now, the resurrection wasn't a mystery. That was taught, I'll show you in a minute. The resurrection was not a mystery, but the rapture was a mystery. That was not taught. It was a secret hidden in the purpose, eternal purpose of God, but was revealed through the Apostle Paul uh, to the Corinthians. Behold, I show unto you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Brothers and sisters, I'm galloping to the close. Fr friends, listen. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to think that that generation that will escape death, that will never die, could be you and me. The Lord could come tonight, come before this meeting ends. It's lovely to go from the tabernacle home to glory. Amen. Be great. The Lord could come at any moment. The New Testament doctrine of imminency. We don't know the day or the hour, Matthew 24, we thought on Sunday night. But we say, perhaps today. Perhaps today. Of that day and hour, no man knows. It could be any day. But how wonderful to know that we could be the generation of Christians that will never die, never see death, but will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and will go home to heaven and live with Christ eternally without dying. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. Turn to John's Gospel, please. Chapter 11. I've just got one last verse or two. John 11 and verse 25. The Gospel of John, of course. John's Gospel, chapter 11 and verse 25, please. Nice to see some of you writing these verses down. Uh, my little talks are recorded. You can get the DVD as well. But John 11, and we're at verse 25 and verse 26. You remember Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, your servant is dead. Martha said unto him, verse 24, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she knew about the resurrection, but she didn't know about the rapture. Now, let, let's read on. Jesus said unto her, and I want you to follow carefully, I am the resurrection, that's one thing, and the life, that's the second thing. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he dies, yet shall he live. He will be resurrected first from the grave and from the dust of his death. And whosoever liveth, whosoever is alive, when I come and believeth in me, shall never die. Believest thou this? Can you see how the Lord Jesus taught exactly the same? Paul taught exactly what the Lord Jesus taught here. The rapture wasn't revealed in the, the, the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus still preached in the Old Testament era. But the, 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 the resurrection of the saints was taught. And here the Lord Jesus says, he, he, I am the resurrection, thinking of the bodies of those who died, believers who have died, and the life, thinking of those who will never die, but will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And whosoever liveth, when I come and believeth in me, the same shall never die. Hey, wouldn't it be good to go home without dying? No death, no hospital, no funeral, no flowers, no doctors, caught up to be with Christ. That may be our privilege, but whether we die or whether we live, we shall go to be with the Lord. Friends, listen, as I finish right here, did Job ever come out of the fog he was living in? When a man dies, that's the end of him, isn't it? Says Job, he, he was a saint of the old, he knew God. But he says, shall a man live when he's died? He, did he, he was living in a fog of confusion. Turn to Job again, find him in your Bible. Job chapter 19, this time. And verse 26. I'm sorry, verse 23. Have you found Job chapter, 20, chapter 19 and verse 23? Before we read, I want to tell you, Job was living in a confusing fog about the destiny of the Christian, of the believer that is. But the light of divine revelation shone into him. Look what he writes now. All that my words were now written, all that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. He says, I've got hold of a great truth. I wish I could preserve it in the rock. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, at the second coming, upon the earth. And though after death, after my skin, worms destroy this body, not very nice to think about, but that's what will happen to us. Worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Presence that wonderful. What a testimony. Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. Though my reins, it refers in the Hebrew Bible to the intestinal, the, the, the in, inner organs of the body. Although that all decays away, and my skin decays and worms will come and destroy this body. But one day, I'm going to see God as He is. La everlasting life. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote, Death is swallowed up in victory. What a great future we have. And it was bought for us at the place called Calvary. Let's sing our closing hymn.